Here we are, 145 days into quarantine time, and we have been here live with you every single day. Today, we've got a very special guest, Thomas Jefferson Kitts. Say hello, Thomas. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, it's nice to actually see somebody, isn't it? Yes. And have somebody in my studio inside. Yeah, yeah these are strange times. Strange. strange indeed. Well, Thomas, uh, why don't you uh, just real briefly give us a feel for what you're going to do today, because I've asked you to do something, and I don't even know what it is. I did, I did secret, uh, for no other reason than just the tease, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, people are still asking me about lead white paint, so I thought I would do a demo with that and talk about the impact lead white has on your paint as you're pushing it around, because there's nothing I think you can add to your paint that changes it more than that. And I'm also going to add this other part, which is the use of what's called sun thickened linseed oil that's been tempered or mixed with regular linseed oil and a little bit of solvent. A combination of those two things can take your contemporary modern paint and make it behave and perform like the old paint, handmade paint from centuries ago. Oh, cool. cool. Well, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. You know, you got me started on lead white and uh, it, it, revolutionized my painting. I do have a lot of questions about whites and I know you're the guy to ask. And so we will get into that in a minute. I'm going to drop you off for a second. I'll do some announcements and then we'll get right back to it. Terrific. I'll see you. All right. I'm glad you're here. All right. Well, welcome to day number 145 live. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazines. We've been trying to be here for you to kind of keep your head in the game, right? It's so easy to doom scroll, to doom view, to just absorb all the negativity that is going on around us and all the questions. And 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 rather than doing that, I wanted to be here for you guys so that you'd at least have something fun to do every day, uh, focusing you on learning art, discovering art, meeting artists, learning a little bit about art marketing, you know, whatever it happens to come up in, in a particular day. So today our guest is Thomas Jefferson Kitts, and we'll get to him in a minute. Uh, each day I'm giving away a subscription to Plen Air Magazine, our digital subscription. And our digital subscription has 25% more content than the print magazine. The uh, print magazine, I'm happy to say, is the number one selling art magazine in America. Barnes & Noble tells us it outsells all in the category of photography and art. It outsells all the magazines. So we're pretty happy with that. Thank you for making that happen. If you don't have a subscription, you can, of course, get one at plenairmagazine.com. Plein air, if you're not familiar, if you're just turning in, is a term for outdoor painting. It's a French term, and you can say it plein or plain. It doesn't matter how you say it. The idea is that you get outdoors to paint, and you can see color and light. So uh, anyway, we're giving away uh, for comments, and so what you want to do is make comments in the comments section. It's nice to hear where you're from, especially if you're from outside of the country, but inside we like to know too, just to kind of know where you're from. And uh, that way, when we announce it, like this announcement, we can say the winner is is uh, Lewis Williams from Colorado, even though I've got a typo in my, in my thing. Congrats, thumbs up, everybody applause for Lewis Williams in Colorado. Now, each day at 3 p.m., we are uh, showing you video segments uh, where we are actually doing art instruction videos to train you in painting. Now, some of our art instruction videos, like the one we're going to show you today, some of them are many, many, many hours long. So we can't show you all of it, but we'll typically show you about a half an hour, 45 minute segment, plus an interview with the artist. Today at 3 p.m., uh, a really special video, it's called Soroya. Uh, essentially the color of light. It's with Thomas Jefferson Kitts, who is our guest today. We're going to talk about uh, the process that he went through on that video in a minute uh, and and how it came about. Uh, and so we'll get into that. I want to remind everybody that we are giving away a painting, a beautiful painting, a, an original from Carl Dempwolf for the month of August. The way to win that is to go to Painting Giveaway. Dot com. Now, Carl painted this. It's a beautiful plein air piece. Maybe it's a studio piece. And uh, it's a 16 by 20. And he even made the frame. So that could be hanging in your living room starting in September. So uh, you only need to enter one time. I should also mention 
that uh, we are doing an event called Realism Live. It is a historic gathering of some of the world's top realist artists. And when I say realist, it's basically not abstract painting or not experimental. It is is what you can see, right? Re representational art. And uh, we had to cancel our annual FACE conference, uh, which was a shame. And the FACE conference this year had morphed into being a little bit different. We not only cover portraits and figures, but we also decided to add some other disciplines. So we're doing that with Realism Live. And so Realism Live is going to be covering a lot of different topics, including uh, figure painting, whether it's tight academic figure painting or loose figure painting. We're gonna be talking about still life, about portraiture, some other figures and portraits. We'll even be doing landscape painting a floral painting and some other topics. And so that's Realism Live and that's October 20 through 24. The 20th is a beginner's day. And so we're, we're bringing people in that are gonna bring things down to very beginner level, like how do you draw a head? What are the proportions of a head? How do you draw a body? How do you do your first painting in uh, you know a floral painting or your first landscape painting? So we're gonna bring that in on the 20th. So this is for very beginner painters or people who wanna learn other subjects or topics that you don't know. And then the rest of the week, we're bringing in these world's top masters who are gonna be teaching in these various subjects for four days. And we also have interactivity. So you will be able to actually go on and interact with us. We have breakout rooms. We have, uh, at the end of the day, we have a big cocktail party where I interview everybody uh, we also will do online painting together. We'll have live models for you to paint and landscapes and so on to paint. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, the last one was a huge success. This one is already, uh, even though it's not till October, this one is already at 700 people registered. It's just grown about 100 in the last week or, or 10 days. And so make sure you get registered. Uh, the price goes up $100 starting August 30th, not the 31st, August 30th, which is my birthday. So uh, you want to get your uh, get your ticket and know that it's 100% refundable. If you have a if you, if you uh, you can't can't make it, you can cancel. If you uh, you get into it and you hate it after the first day, you just let us know. We will give your money back and and then we'll take you off the feed so you're not getting it anymore. But we want to make sure that that you're getting something that you love. And uh, also there are replays. When you go to realismlive.com, there's choices of three different replay levels. And also each of these levels come with other things. And so uh, if you cannot make the date, you can go ahead and if you if you go ahead and invest in it before the date, you can actually get the replay to watch on demand when you want to watch, uh, which will be helpful for you. And so, you know, if you're working and you can't make all the days, you can make the weekend after or whatever, you can watch it. Then, but of course, if you watch it live, you get the benefit of all of the interactivity with people, which is really a lot of fun. So uh, make sure you check out realismlive.com. Uh, Mention that uh, Plein Air Magazine is going into Michael's stores. Uh, this is from our understanding, and I, I don't want to misrepresent this, I might be wrong, but my understanding is that Michael's does not carry any art magazines. And so we think Plein Air Magazine is the first art magazine in the Michael stores. And it's neat that they're interested in Plein Air painting. That just tells us what's happening with the Plein Air movement around the world. And uh, so we're not in every Michael store, but we're in 278 of them nationwide. That'll start in October. So we're gonna ask you guys to support us on that. That'll be pretty cool. Uh, also want to mention to you that we have uh, what's called the Plen Air Podcast. Every week, wherever you get podcasts, iTunes or Spotify or otherwise, just look for the Plen Air Podcast. And uh, we interview great people, uh, great artists, and sometimes gallery directors and others. We also have what's called the Art Marketing Minute Podcast for artists who want to learn how to sell and, uh, and market their art. And so I answer questions on that. And that's what that's all about. So make sure you look for that. Okay, so I think that's all I've got in announcements today. I, one other thing is we are doing a plein air convention live and in person in May in Denver, Colorado. And so make sure that you get signed up for that. Uh, again, if we have to cancel or postpone, you can get your money back. So it's not a problem there. And uh, we got a lot going on, but I want to get right to Thomas Jefferson Kitts because 
there is uh, there's a, he's got a lot of stuff to show you today. And uh, Thomas is going to be our, our guest artist today at 3 p.m. And he's going to be doing um, uh, Soroya, The Color of Light. And uh, I want to show you the cover of this. Whoops, that's Sergeant. Well, let's talk <laughs> about that. This is, a, this is Thomas's most recent video. Uh, Thomas, tell us about the uh, the Sergeant video, what you were thinking and, and, and what you wanted to, wanted to communicate in that video. Well, I think everybody knows Sergeant's portraiture. And I wanted to show some of the more uh, genre stuff that he was doing, which was treated differently than the portraiture when he didn't have a client per se and he could really do his own thing. So this is based off of that kind of work. Um, I don't know what else to add other than I had a great time doing it and uh, I hear people like it. Well, they did. And and um, what I loved about it is that you spent a lot of time, a lot of years digging into Sargent and understanding his techniques. And, yeah. and obviously none of us, no person alive today can paint like Sargent but yep. you, you've managed to pull off uh, really communicating how he did it by studying his notes, his people, talking to his family members and so on, and really getting an understanding of, of how Sargent painted. So I think that's good. The, the video we're featuring today yeah. is Soroya painting the color of light. And this kind of came about because I had been in Spain and had uh, when I was in Spain, I got you know lucky. I took a group of art collectors there, and we ended up seeing five different Soroya shows, which just was very unusual. And um, and I just I, I always loved Soroya, but once I went to the Soroya house, saw it in person, I thought we need to learn how to paint like Soroya. And it turns out you also had studied Soroya. So talk about the process that you went through in creating this video. Well, there's about five years of, of study and travel before we even got and got the video. I think you froze up. Uh, we're getting a we're getting a scratchy signal. It almost sounds like the Wi-Fi is not connecting well or something. Are you there? All right, I'm going to pull you off camera for a second, and then I'll bring you back in as soon as you get your camera reset. I think that's, we discussed that that is a possibility. Anyway, the Soroya video, what Thomas did is he uh, he hired a model, flew out to the coast, brought the model along, and did a series of photographs with the model. And then, uh, ah, he's back. Oh, I hope that's not a, a repeating thing. Um, well, you never know. Anyway, yeah. so you brought a model out. You photographed the model in the afternoon light. Tell us about yes. that. Uh, we actually, it, was, it was late November of all times, and so I flew down to the uh, Laguna Beach area where I knew there was an area that looked like many of the places that Sori had painted. And I hired, uh, you know, Tony Sky, who's that's her stage name. She did a great job. We had about five minutes to get our shot, so it was an intense three days because it was my one chance to get my references, and it happened. It came together. Yeah, and, and I think that one of one of the things that this also proves is that you can paint the color of light from light. a photograph. Uh, talk briefly about how you get to the point where you can make photographs look like they were painted outdoors with without having the disadvantages of the photograph. Yeah, well, I'm going to preface that by saying if I have the option, I'll paint outside over from a photo every time. But obviously, since we were going to do this in a studio under cameras and lights, that wasn't an option. So one of the reasons I chose that particular time of day was we were going to get a strong, warm side light coming off the ocean in the sun, and then a, a bluish cool light coming down from the sky behind. And because those colors were so strong, they recorded on the paint on the photo. And all I had to do is pretty much paint to the photo. There are a few adjustments I made, but paint to the photo. Yeah. I'm an ex-illustrator, ex so I'm pretty good at getting the references. So Thomas, uh, you sent me a bunch of uh, images and I'm not exactly sure what you want to do with those. Do you have something in mind? Uh, I just thought if you wanted to roll them in, great. If, you, if there's not enough time, don't worry about it. They can well, see let's that. do it. Let's, I'm just going to show some images, oh. and you can just give me a, you know, a lightning round brief moment about each image. This is 4.30 a.m. 
January on Mount Hood from the south side. Uh, this is not plein air. I did one just like it, that plein air, a couple years ago. This was painted for a friend. Um, so I used the knowledge I got from being on site, and then I used my reference in Princeton. All right. That's a plein air painting on plein air. That's down in Texas. Uh, those are two 500, 500 oak trees that are very venerated in Midland, Texas area. Um, it won an award at the uh, Own Plein Air Texas show last year. Uh, now, this is closer to home. This is a pioneer apple orchard that's maybe 20 minutes from my house. And I'd never seen it when the blossoms were on and dropping. I'd seen it when the apples were there, and I painted it many times. I love the abstract quality of it. But this case, it was soft light, and it was just, I don't know, it just spoke to me. All right. Oh, this is one of my favorite places to paint in the whole world. This is Cypress Point, uh, where uh, Point Lobos is. And this is, of course, in the morning. If you know the space, you know the light's coming in low on the left and you're looking south. The colors and the forms and shapes in that little eight-mile area are astounding. It's kind of made it a holy mecca for plein air painters. Absolutely. All right. Uh, that's a detail from a watercolor, another favorite place that I love to paint in Central Oregon. It's on the dry side of the Cascades, so it's it's east. In fact, I'll be going there next week and probably painting some more. There's the whole thing. Uh, this is done on plein air, standing right there. The water is unbelievable. The color in it because of the volcanic uh, soil and the temperature of the water. I paint If I paint the water as it truly, truly is, people don't believe it. Here, yeah. oh, this is from last year. This is actually uh, downtown Portland. Uh, late night, eating out late or something. Again, plein air standing on a street corner, looking back at this row of food carts. Love this. I want to do more of this. Yeah, really. This is the latest painting, actually. This is a fall, again, in Central Oregon. It's called Paul, Paulina Creek Falls. And I don't know. I don't know what to say. This is at uh, first thaw. You can see there's a snowbank in the immediate lower right corner. It's yeah, just beautiful. So what is the key to painting a waterfall and making it feel right? Because the tendency is to just want to pile on white paint. Yeah, it's, now you're asking me to sell my workshop Thursday. So I'm just simply going to say, uh, if anybody wants to know, they should probably look at the website at the lower right corner while I'm doing my demo, go visit the site. I'm going to teach this waterfall. It's going to repeat a number of times because a lot of people want to take it. Okay. Um, but in essence, it's less white than you think. Okay. Um, well, we'll get. We'll have to go to your workshop to find out the, the answers. Tell us about this still life. Okay, so this is at the start of the COVID, you know, uh, self quarantining, and I was thinking I have always had a love for still life, uh, and in fact, I, I sort of trained and became better because of still lights. And when people work with me, I encourage them to start with still lights because the light doesn't move. So you have time to sort of build things up and experiment. And this is a highly rendered, when I say rendered, I don't mean like smooth. I just mean you know, a lot of looking at the various little bits of color uh, in this cloisonne kind of vase. The lemon was put in there just as an accent. You know, everything was so medium value, the reds, the greens, the background. It needed something to pop it and describe the same thing that happens on the vase itself. So that's why the uh, lemon went in there. All right. Ah, again, another beautiful place. This That's is a classic. Beautiful, That's beautiful. Isn't it? This one's actually in the permanent collection of the Merrill, Merrill Hill uh, Art Museum in Washington. Um, I have two paintings there now. And they only collect work really from the area. This is maybe an hour from that uh, museum. This is late August, August when I would be doing painting up there just because. Just Although in this case, this was a competition piece for the Pacific Northwest uh, plein air which is another painting contest. All right, we got two more. Okay, this again, I I love this river. Uh, I don't get up to it very often, but I should. When I, the same contest, I was doing that with a friend. We went up to this, this river, it's called White Salmon on the Washington side. And I was doing watercolors that year and I thought, ah, can I, should I, will I? And, you know, while I'm painting this, we have rafts, rafters coming down these rapids, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, nice. Yes, and then finally, this is uh, 
This is, uh, shoot, what is the name of the lighthouse? But it's down mid coast in Oregon. It was a winter day. I was staying with friends in the area, but I went out to paint this at low tide. Is that Lincoln <laughs> City? Sorry? Lincoln City? Uh, uh, south of, it's sort of, it's right next to Newport. Oh, Newport, okay. Yeah, you know it then. And by the way, this lighthouse, this architecture shows up so many times as you go down the coast of Northern California. It's like they use the same build plans for the same lighthouses. But this one is situated so perfectly. Oh, and I, yeah. wish, I wish we had a detailed shot so that, you know, we could see the little tiny people that lend its scale. That's the part that I love. Perfect. Okay, so Tom, why don't you um, why don't you go ahead and get started on it? Tom has got uh, set up, so he's going to do a little bit of a demo for us. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just kind of drop off in the background. You may hear a question from me from time to time, or I may throw in a question from the comments. Um, but uh, why don't we go ahead and get rolling here? Fantastic. So I'm looking at the clock now, and I think we have about 40 minutes before you know we reach the end of this broadcast. So first, I want to say thank you all for showing up. Um, I'm happy to be here and do this for you. I would love to get feedback. Any way you want to reach me is fine. Google my name. There'll be many ways you can get a hold of me. Uh, I don't see the comments, so I can't answer your questions directly. But if you do have questions, put them in the comments, as Eric says, and he'll read them back to me. Uh, today, we're going to focus on some geeky stuff. We're going to focus on the lead white use of lead white in paint, what it does to the movement of your paint in the brushwork, and combine that with uh, sort of a mixture of something called sun thickened linseed oil and refined linseed oil. The sun thickened linseed oil actually also changes how the paint moves. It sort of moves it around whenever you want to move it, and then it sort of makes the paint drop and stick in place. And so it kind of freezes or unfreezes depending what you're doing with the paint. Uh, the, the linseed oil's purpose is just to kind of mitigate the glossy enamel-like finish. If you use only sun thickened oil, your paintings are going to turn super glossy, and that's not always what you want. On the other side of that is that I'm going to be painting with a ivory black and a there. Let's take a look at that. All right, so there's the palette for the day, and I've pre-mixed some of the colors. But I want to point out that this is ivory black and this is burnt umber. And those are both colors that tend to suck up the oil out of your paint and dry matte. If you're using just a little, and I mean just a little, very little, uh, of the, of the uh, sun thickened linseed oil, those colors won't turn matte. It'll stay rich and luscious, and there'll be light that bounces all around inside of the film before it comes back out into your eye. So just quickly, because we're going to move along here, this is the lead white over here. And you'll see me use a lot of it. This is probably a third to a quarter of the paint I hope to have in the next 20, 30 minutes. This is cad yellow here, cad yellow light, I should say. This is quinacridone uh, red, which is a bit of an outlier, because I often paint with a cad red instead, but I thought I'd try this. It's characteristically stronger. Its chroma is more intense. It's not something that Sir Royal would have used because he didn't have it available. But if he had it available, I would bet he would have used it because that guy liked saturation. Then we have, this is just your, your sort of garden variety uh, ultramarine blue. Uh, it's not even a red shade. It's just basic right in between. This is Prussian blue, which has a green cast to it. It sort of stands in for my cerulean, or my manganese, or say my phthalo blue green shade. Now why use Prussian blue? Well, it's because when you combine Prussian blue and the burnt umber and the lead white, and you have that in your paint films, your painting will dry very rapidly. In fact, I think the fastest color I've ever painted with is Prussian blue. If I just put a little of that into a color, boom, the next day I come back to a dry surface eminently ready, ready for painting. So I do paint with a lot of gamblings, but I also paint with other paints. So I'm not totally a fanboy, although it's good stuff. I just put this up so you can see the size of the tubes I buy. I've kind of, I reached a point in my life where getting the small ones, are it's kind of a waste of time. I'll use a small tube up in a single painting. So I'm gonna take those aside, which gives me more room to mix. And in this case, 
this is a Williamsburg flake white. And it's, I think, a pretty good value for a flake white. It is not, I want to be real clear, it is not the same thing as flake lead white. Even though it says it on the label, the actual shape of the pigment, which is what is the magic in, in lead white, it's more homogeneous and more round. In flake lead white, it literally is flakes that overlay and sort of interlock. And that kind of paint is very expensive because it's very hard to make. So when you look at flake white or flake lead white, the first question you want to ask is, is it really from what's called the Dutch stack process? And that is a very labor intensive, as I said, way of making white. Google it, Duck, Dutch stack process. You'll be surprised to learn about some of the ingredients, which I, I can talk about on air uh, and how it's made, okay? But, if you're starting out with lead white, this is a great one just to kind of learn to see what it does because it does behave similar, just not as refined. In fact, let's put more out. Okay. So tell me, uh, help me understand that a little bit more. Sure. The difference between a flake white and a lead white, because flake is made with lead, it's the process of how it's made, but how does it perform differently? Oh, well, great answer. Okay, this I'm going to get geeky here. Um, when your when your particles in your paint, when your pigment in your paint are different sizes and different shapes, they act on a microscopic level differently than if they're the same shape and the same size. Modern paint tends to move the pigments and colorants to the same size and even smaller than what was used, you know, 150, 200 years ago. So just the physical size and shape of the pigment in lead white is more varied. And it creates something called thixotropic uh, properties. And I, I alluded to that at the very front end of it. Thixotropic properties is, okay, here's a great analogy. If you looked up along a snow field and it's static, it's not moving, it's like a solid. You're looking up the hill at a pile of snow. Now suddenly something causes that hill to break loose and it's now an avalanche. Well, that solid, snow is now acting like a liquid and then when it reaches the bottom it's not moving anymore it becomes a solid again it becomes like concrete that's what we're talking we're talking that's the thixotropic quality of lead white you really are a geek i know i'm totally geeking think of it this way as long as i keep my stroke moving it's a liquid but the moment i stop it becomes it drops it becomes solid and you're going to see that you're going to see that when I'm painting. And the, and the uh, sun thickened linseed oil only enhances that uh, characteristic. I think it acts like a grease, basically, which is why I pre-mixed. All these piles have some of the sun thickened oil. This is my, if you can see this, that's the, the dipping cup that has the, it's like one part sun thickened oil to five parts linseed oil. There's nothing rigid about that, but that's kind of what I like to start with. And if I feel like I want to thin it, I'm going to throw a little solvent in there. In this case, I'm, it's Gamsol. It could be any solvent. If you are painting with turpentine, which I don't recommend, you can use that. Or you can use any solvent, any odorless mineral spirits, which I do think is better. Okay, again, I'm going to clear this, and we're going to start painting. Did that answer your question? I think so, yes. Would you, uh, somebody ask about your solvents again. So it's sun-thickened linseed oil. What was the other one? Just refined linseed oil. So like refined, so refined. refined linseed oil plus sun-thickened plus a tiny touch of solvent. Yeah, and you know, you would, you would uh, sort of play with those three elements to your taste. The more sun-thickened oil you add, the more you're going to end up with an enamel glossy like surface, not unlike, say, the Northern Flemish painters, um, which is great if that's what you want. If you use less, then it stays more like real, like the paint you have. The okay, solvent, well, let's get started painting because you got about 28 yeah. minutes. Wow, this is going to be speed painting. You're going to be speed painting, that's yeah. right. In that case, I think I'm going to use just a couple brushes. This is a of uh, linen surface it is it has a little wet wash this is just a wash of uh, burnt umber we cannot see your surface oh thank you and please 
let me know and I, I always forget to turn the dang camera to the right thing. Okay, so what I said. Okay, and just so everyone can see, this is my still life that I'm gonna paint from. I don't think we're gonna get very far, but we can. I'll, I'll try to push to get you an uh, uh, idea of what White's gonna do. Okay, so, we're gonna find out how good you really are because if you can't, <laughs> if you can't get a simple subject like that done in 28 minutes, oh, you're just yeah. a winner. Yeah, sure, no worries. Okay, so actually let's do the split screen because I think that's, we should just, whoa, wait a second. I can change that, guys. Sorry about that. It's easy enough for me to do. Camera and reference. Okay. Hello. There we go. Still working out some of those technical issues. Okay. So I'm going to flip back between that and the, the mixing palette as I go. Hopefully I'm going to stay out of the way. Now... This is starting off very thin, and I'm looking at the shapes that the flowers. I don't want to worry about the actual fluffy parts of the flowers, so to speak. I just want to look at the unified sort of super shape is my term for it. Like this. Your head is flower. blocking a little bit. What? Your head is blocking a little. All right. Okay. Chime in there, please, as needed. So I'm just kind of looking at without outlining. I just dipped into the oil. This is going to get drippy very quickly because we have little time. And this is just meant to be sort of context, environment for the flowers. I do want to, because of this medium sort of encourages it, I want to use um, a variety of strokes. I've always been interested in the handwork, the gesture of artists and this will drip which is fine because over time i can clean all that up if i choose to you know if you went to the Mo if you went to moma this would be a finished painting right now you know i like a lot of those i do too it looks like we froze up again Hello, Thomas. I'm going to pull him off camera, put him back on, and see what happens. Well, this is the magic of live. And uh, his camera froze up. He said that could happen. And so he's going to reset it, and it'll be back in just a second, I'm sure. And so I'm going to put him on split screen with me. He should come on any second. Anyway, we're watching Thomas Jefferson Kitts. He's going to do a a floral. He's blocking in the background right now. Here he is. He's back. Uh, I, don't, I, I literally have no idea what's going on here. This has never been an issue. So it has to be now, doesn't it? All right. So again, I'm just going to start laying in lights and darks, knowing that I can pick things out. That is just a color tint that's meant to be close to the shadow shape. Now, this is where I'm actually taking pure paint from my paint piles, unmixed paint. And because I know there's oil there, I'm just pushing it in. And it's going to leave or give me a soft edge. And again, paint will move. I get that. Paint will move and drip. That's okay. Let it drip. And if you want a drier paint, you just don't push it into the oil. Okay, now I'm going to change up on my brushes. Okay, now here goes with some of the, the some of the light. Okay, all I'm doing is I'm tipping from some of these mixed piles here, and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually just clearing the way on my screen here. So now you may be able to see that this paint is going down thick. I want to create a bed of paint. Is that a pure white or is that slightly tinted? It's slightly tinted with a yellow. 
And I'll probably come back if I have time and push some of that to the blue white. But the idea here is that just to kind of, again, this is not a process I repeat every time, but it is something that you need know, too often. Now there's a dimensional striation occurring because I'm painting so quickly uh, and thickly is what I meant to say. So this goes more pink and these are close in value. And then they go darker. Now the oil here is really causing my brush stroke to bleed. And this is more Sargent-esque by the way. I know that my drawing is not that great right now, but this sort of bleeding of the edges is one of the ways he sort of joined um, shapes. Somebody asked if, if you were not trying to paint so rapidly, would you let the background dry first? No, I wouldn't. Um, if I'm outside, I would actually be painting this, this rapidly, but since I'm working from a photographic reference and I'm indoors, I would probably slow down to half speed a good friend of mine once told me, Thomas, you have your outdoor speed, you have your indoor speed. Um, and I found that to be true. But generally, I would be painting this quickly and making decisions this quickly. What do you mean by striation? Striation, uh, impasto, the directionality of the mark. If you look at this patch right here, I, I'm looking at what I think you're seeing. There's a dimensional bump that catches light this way and casts a shadow. So impasto. But there, Can you bring up your reference uh, photo again? Yeah. Side yeah. by side. Sure, sure. Okay, where's my mouse? There we go. There. Okay. In fact, I'm using a soft brush. I'm going to move to a harder brush. I did a boar bristle or a hog hair because I want to sort of act, I want to amplify the, uh, the um, striation. Now there's that oil. You saw me wipe that off because I wanted to make a big change. There's still oil on the surface, which is important to remember. And that actually helps me Blend, when I say blend, I don't mean like render, but it, it, it sort of causes the, the paint to sort of join the other areas in a way that, that if I tried to paint that, would not be so easy. Okay, so what I'm getting here is expressionistic uh, movement of the paint. And it will continue to move a little bit as I go. One thing I did not mention about lead white is once it drops, once it stops and sits, you can actually put thick paint into it or on it without disturbing what's below. And you get a, a wider, in my opinion, wider range of expression. And, you know, it's, it's literally, uh, it's like having more notes on a keyboard if you're playing a piano. That's a good analogy in my mind. So right there, there's all these very nice, lovely, sort of soft edges, found edges, and I didn't even have to work at it. Are we still doing the moment thing? No, no, you're getting you're getting a little a little closer away from the moment, a little <laughs> further away from the moment. You know, I had to study uh, modern art, what we call art since '45, as an undergrad, and I hate it. Going into that classroom, but I've learned to love it. I'll just say that. I know that, that those are fighting words for some people, but I love abstract expressionism. I learned a lot from AE because they were just pushing paint around. They weren't necessarily trying to make it be something. Does that make sense? Uh, certainly not trying to be derogatory towards it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand why it's not everybody's cup of tea. But I actually, when I'm teaching, I talk about AE painters a lot because we're talking about composition. Now, you see, I was just going up and down, but then I went like this arbitrarily. Again, you got, it, got in the way. All right. Oh, like, like I'm going like this. And that's just, again, very up the surface. Because if I have a interesting surface, 
created by the brush. The odds are I'm going to have an interesting painting. Now let's go ahead and blend slightly here because we get we lose the glass. You talked about waterfall. To me, waterfalls and glass are very similar. And you, have, you can use close values. You can use transparency. You can use all these sort of textural effects of the paint. The paint, the lead is going to increase. But when I say texture, I don't mean just bump or impasto. I mean also just like the transparency or the striation because this stuff that has lead in it, it drops, but it doesn't move. This stuff that doesn't have lead in it softens. Interesting. Yeah. You got about 15 minutes. Oh, plenty of time. No worries. I'm kidding, of course, but hey, what else am I going to say? You're up for it. You can do it. You know me. This is this is pretty close to the way the speed I paint outdoors out of necessity, but I'm not talking. So I'm sort of in a deeper mind space. We can't see what you're doing. Oh uh, yeah. I was mixing. Um okay. and I want something that's warmer. It's a little darker than I want. So here I'm gonna wipe it. And I don't care about that, not yet. So let's cool that down. The way I would do that is I'm just gonna take some blue which cools it down. I want to raise it, the value. Now it's gone a little too blue. Take it back towards more of a reddish purple. And I know the camera is adding contrast, you know, so this is probably looking a little more dark and contrasty than, than it is to you. Now this kind of thing. Oh, okay, bring, your, bring yep. your canvas back. There we go, back to four. This sort of mark making that I just did there is kind of what's you can do now. I'm just lightening the pressure of my brush and I'm sort of picking at it. You'll see this in a lot of the painters that I venerate of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And of course, you'll see it in my work because I'm interested in that. See how I just changed the direction of that mark? Because this directionality of the stroke is what sort of, how shall I say, it stands in for. It stands in for um, rendering or detail. I don't want to spend or waste a lot of time on detail. Now, all I'm doing here is just covering things up. I'm looking at this is going darker and more neutral here. This actually goes a little bluer. Now, again, that's thick paint. Now, the, the viewer who asked if this is how fast I would paint, I probably wouldn't leap to the thick paint this quickly. I would sort of map things or map things out a little more carefully. But once I knew where things are supposed to go and what the values would be, are supposed to be, yeah, I would. Now, this is interesting. In this flower here, there's a sort of darker passage within that, that then hooks up or meets the value expressed in here. This is pinkish, this is yellowish, but the similar value is what pulls it together. This shadow and this shadow come together. So by the way, when I shot this, I did set it up and shot it, I wanted it to be a dominant place where light was lighter and dark was darker. Now let's go ahead and jump down below in the cloth because there's if this is the light that's happening, it needs to show up elsewhere. So here we have, it's not very dark, but it is darker. And let's make it a little less neutral. Let's make it just a little more blue. I know that what you're looking at is a little more bluer than what's on my monitor because I know my monitor. I'm painting from a 40 inch very old monitor which I need to replace because it, it shows me an image that's warmer than what I'm trying to paint. And again, I'm just trying to mass. I'm just trying to, here's some of the oil. You're not seeing that, don't worry. There's a little bit of the uh, jam salt, the salt salt. And that's just to get the kind of thinner quality that I want here. The fact that I put oil, the, the uh, sand oil into this mix means that this area here is not going to turn uh, matte. It's going to sort of hold on to a more glossy, transparent quality. 
Now, I'm going to wipe this so I can put the dark, I mean, I can put the light area in there, which will kind of work with that. I'm also going to bring this area down in value because I'm looking at this area of the of the um, pot. And now we're going to go back to here. And I can see we have a drawing issue that I want to fix. So we'll take this up higher. Now, again, that one thing I didn't mention about lead white is it is not as opaque than, than uh, titanium white. It doesn't cover up as well. So it's important to kind of make sure you have ground that's white or off-white for a certain value underneath it. Or you do have to wait and come back at a later point to put it down. And if you look at a lot of these paintings from the time period I'm talking about, you'll find that the lead white is applied very thickly. Now this needs to change because the color of it you guys are enjoying this. Put something in the uh, in the comments section, or do a heart or a like. We want to make sure that you're liking what's happening. Yes, I need I need more affirmation, Eric. I, I do. Yeah, that's right. Well, you're getting a lot of affirmation. Oh, what size is, is your brush? Half inch across. I don't use brush number sizes anymore because they're like women's clothing. Um, there, there's no systematic uh, application of size. So I've, I've noticed that with uh, women's apparel, the more expensive it is, the smaller the size it claims to be. Um, I don't see that happening with the guys. It's, it's medium, small, extra tall, whatever. And I hope I didn't offend anybody with that comment, but I think it is funny. funny. Okay, so I need to change this. The value and the hue of that needs to be closer to the actual cloth, my, the source. So now we have a sense of light. Now I'm going to put this down thick here. This is not that different from the demo I wanted to do at the uh, pace this year, um, where you really get some thick paint going on. Um, and then you kind of blend, not blend, but you kind of find ways to integrate like that, the thick to thin. This is thick. This is thin. This is very transparent. Now, so you keep, you keep uh, don't you typically try to keep your darks transparent, shadows transparent? Yeah, that's the classical way, which is, you know, what is it? It's transparent darks, loaded lights. Um, we can think of it different ways. But in contemporary times, it is fine. It's acceptable to go with dark, um, thick, dark paint. When you paint with the stand oil, the stand oil is going to level out. So if it's in your darks, whatever bumps were there are going to flatten out over the next couple hours. So you can do it that way. And then you just end up using the more paint in the light areas uh, to, to make it more thick. You got about six minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I know that's a lot, a lot of time. What I'm going to do is sort of bring the flowers into the murk. That's what we're going to do. Let's give myself some murk. And this is just to sort of transition out into the edge of the painting. So we go from darker, more transparent. You can see I'm moving very quickly, varying up. If I find myself doing the same stroke too much, I want to vary it. Okay, now I'm going to step in front of the camera for this poll. The reason is I want to be on this side so I can really track it. Now, let's talk about making this go into the mark. Not that that's a uh, official art term, but why not? You know what I'm going to do is I will photograph this and post this on my Facebook page. And if I continue to work it, I'll do it then. But I'll, at a stopping point later today, you'll see it there if you want to be able to sort of get a blow up or a larger image than what you might be seeing on your, on your uh, device. Okay, so now I'm going to use the opacity of the light. And it's a soft opacity because it's lead white. And I'm going to uh, take the flowers into the murk. Now, what you don't see me doing, certainly right now, is you don't see me um, 
trying to render all the little fluffs and ruffles and curls. That stuff comes later, after you have the basic shapes laid down. And I'm also, again, remember, I'm using, using the directionality of my stroke to indicate um, the sort of motion of those petals. Now, this is different than, say, other painters who really, really carefully slow down and make their poles careful. But that's the difference between, say, me and them. Now, this needs to turn. It needs to go into the, the dark to the point where we're going to want to lose the edge. That alone is now starting to round out the flowers. You're trying to you're trying to create the value uh, similar to the background on those edges. A transition to it. I mean, technically, there would be areas, and this would be more apparent if we were if I'm actually looking at the still life. Like right here, there'll be areas where it just disappears. It's you know you don't really see where it starts and stops, and that's important. Having these lost edges is very important. So there's a transition between this, this, and this now. And so suddenly this takes on, takes on an integration. There's a point where this and this combine and merge. It's not equal everywhere. It's just, this is what most people call lost and found edges. Okay. Got about six minutes. Oh, you said that six minutes ago. Oh, maybe I maybe I got it calculated wrong. Now Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and give you an edge because in contrast, I want this to be soft. I want this to be hard. Right in here. But I don't want it to be abrupt. I don't want like suddenly it's black. Like I want to lose this edge right here. So now I'm going to go in here underneath. And we're gonna... This is again, it's like water. It's like the waterfall. If you paint the waterfall static, like everything's got an edge, it'll never really look like a waterfall because you see movement. And in some ways, metaphorically, we see movement here. And I'm trying to make this very simple, by the way. I'm not trying to jump in on detail yet. I'm working on a painting right now, a three by four foot plein air painting that on Sylvia Island near my house. It'll probably be a four or five, six session painting. And it's gonna go loose, tight, loose, tight, loose, tight. And um, that's kind of how I work. Here's something I want. I wanna take away some paint. This is where the impasto, the lead white has become too much right now. So I just want to take it off. I love saying this. I don't know if Sir Roy did this or not. Sir Roy. Sergeant was known to scrape incessantly. Um, and he used to have complaints. People would complain to him how many times he would scrape down their portrait. I'm sure he did that with his personal painting as well. Now the value of that's a little dark. I'm going to leave it for now since we have six minutes. And let's let's go ahead and take this a little darker. Now I'm putting thick paint on top of thick paint. This is only what happens when you do that. Um, you have to put paint down. If you don't put paint down, you can't do this. You can't make a painting look painterly, really, without paint. So the difference between a painting and a colored drawing in my mind is how much paint is involved. At least that's what I think. Now let's put a couple highlights. We're down to what? Three, four minutes or less? Uh, I'm going to say three minutes tops. Okay. I'm going to point out one thing. If I want to, if I want to, I make some colors here. I don't want to switch over to it. But if I want to put this thicker paint down on top of the paint that's already there, there has to be more oil or fat content in the new paint that I'm putting down. Otherwise, it won't come off my brush. If I try to put, say, drier or leaner paint on top of more oily or fatter paint, it doesn't happen. It doesn't come off the brush. And so what I'm doing is with my knife, I'm mixing some highlights, which I'm going to put down to kind of give us a rounded sense of form. And I'm going to change how the thing I pull. So I don't know if you can see this, but that's it in profile. And there's, there's even a little string hanging off there. We didn't talk about the stringy nature. And in this case, this case pull in the direction I want the mark and even dab. 
not necessarily what I wanted. It's kind of getting a little expressionistic. And I'm barely touching the surface. The idea here is that I want the striation to stand in for the fluff of these flowers. You'll find this a lot in, uh, in Sorio's work, as well as Sargent's, where, he, or, where they are letting the sort of thickness of the paint speak to the quality, the materiality of the art painting. And you'll find also that they do double dipping, which is not a good thing if you're an accountant, but if you're a painter, I'm, I only have one color on here. At some point, I might want to put two or three colors on there and pull it together. And if you're ever in front of these painters, look at where they do it. It's amazing what happens. Um, you know, you get kind of a quality that just doesn't exist if you try to paint that. Now you can start to see how the, the light is catching, you know, the light is catching certain planes or sides. Now this is getting kind of sticky, which is what I want, but it's a different kind of sticky than say painting with an alkyd. Alkyds do get sticky when the uh, solvent evaporates out. This is sticky, but it also remains more fluid. I can move this paint paint if I want. So now with just a few variations of, these are shapes, these are more edges. I can sort of convey the idea of side light. You step in when you need to, uh, yep. Eric. And I am gonna have to rework, I'm gonna have to work this more. I just like where this is going. Um, well, you've given us a really terrific foundation. That's pretty, that's about as far as we're gonna get. Now again, I don't know if you can see this, but that's exactly what I'm after right there. There's sort of like this black, this blue, and this yellow. I got a suggestion for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, why don't you stop now, and then anybody who wants to see you finish, go to your Facebook page and just go on Facebook Live and finish it. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so put your brush down. Come back on camera. All right. <laughs> uh, fabulous. Okay, we need to see your face so we sure can we say goodbye. Thomas, that was a Herculean effort. Yeah, thank you. It's speed painting, and that's a good thing to go out there and do that every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for being on today and for putting this all together and all the hard work that went into it. Really appreciate it. If if Are you going to go on Facebook Live and continue? I am, but I don't know if I'll get there. To, I might try to do it today. Okay. I'd rather give an announcement out and then do it. So maybe tomorrow. Okay. All right. Good. Well, just uh, don't 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 do it at noon Eastern. Oh right, 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 right. No, 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 no. We won't do that. I won't compete <laughs> with that. We'll do right. it. Uh... You can let everybody know. Yeah. All right. We'll talk. We'll talk. All right. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. All right. It was Thomas Jefferson Kitts. Wow, I'll tell you, that's pressure to, to be able to do something like that, that good, that fast. Pretty amazing. So thank you again to Thomas Jefferson Kitts. Uh, reminder that the end of the month is coming soon. You want to get your entries into the Plen Air Salon at plenairsalon.com. Remember, the price goes up for Realism Live on the 30th of August. You can save 100 bucks if you get in now. Uh, we've already got 700 people signed up. It's going to be a pretty big big group of people and it's going to be a lot of fun and there's a money back guarantee and just go to realismlive.com. I will be here tomorrow. I'm going to uh, get, I'll be here today. Uh, tomorrow I'll be on live and then I'm going to get in the car and take my daughter up to school. So thank you guys for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>